Hello to all of you unconventional conventionists. Welcome back to Rocky Talk. It's a Rocky Horror Podcast where we talk about anything and everything that has to do with Rocky Horror. My name's John. I'm Nikki. And I'm Aaron. How y'all doing? Happy Monday. We're recording this on a Monday. I'm still at work. It's Woo! okay. He's okay. Shut the hell up. Sorry, I watched you for Madness last night. And how was it? It was good. Me and my very good buddy Joey were looking at some choreography and having a grand old time with it, but uh, it was a lot of fun. It was silly fun. I love Reefer Madness. I'll never get tired of that movie. Speaking of choreography, though, guess what I did this Friday, boys? What'd you do? I What'd fucking you do? debuted as Mr. Raff. Rick That's himself. what you did. I nice. felt so hot. Oh my God, I had so much fun. I got to use my normal hair. I never want to play anything else. Like, That's Riff what I'm is just who I am. I am Riff. We are one. That's what I I'm don't saying. understand why anyone plays any other role. That's ever. what I'm saying. No, literally, like, when you go from playing Janet to playing Riff, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Like, I, as Janet, I just sit there and do my silly little, like, fucking trad wife bullshit, be boring. And then as Riff, I get to be a fucking goblin, bro. Yep. Being a goblin is so incredibly underrated. Riff is the best character to play in the show. Nobody can convince me otherwise. And I'm glad that you are finally on my side of the river. I agree. No, I agree completely. Riff is not the best character in the show. Who is it then? Aaron? It's obviously Dr. Scott. Wrong. You get to be the most funny. You you don't have to actually do anything. Wrong. And you wear the coolest costume in the whole show, a bitch in suit. Wrong. I... Is it really a bitch in suit? Well, it's gray. <laughs> no. Dr. Scott was the first role I ever played, and I can attest to the fact that he is so fucking boring. I will it's a agree, good role though. to debut. Sounds like you're doing it wrong. I will agree with Aaron, though, that gray suits are the most bitchin' because you can wear literally everything with them. <laughs> I Ray will does say, though, that everything. the two of you playing Dr. Scott versus 17-year-old me playing Dr. Scott are, are very different performances. <laughs> wow. Wow. Did you just say that you typecast me in that role? No, just that a grown man and a teenage girl that's still in high school are, um, for context, I am not 17 <laughs> right now, <laughs> but I was at one time. I wasn't. All right. Must have been nice. What about you, Aaron? What happened this week for you? Oh my God! Um, So uh, I'm gonna push up my nerd glasses here. Uh, This week, I finally reached uh, legend rank in Hearthstone. Let's go. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Is it is it comp? Yeah. So uh, in the in the wild game mode, because fuck standard, uh, I uh, finally put in the number of reps that I needed to do to get all the way up to the top tier. Uh, So I am sitting cool and easy at number one thousand three hundred and something globally. Um, And by globally, I mean only in the Americas. No, it's cool. I love that game. I've played it for a long time. Fuck Blizzard Activision, but. Finally got a chance to sit down and uh, grind the number of games to get my uh, my rating up high enough. And uh, yeah, that was super fun. It was super exciting. It's something that I've wanted to do since the game came out, and I've just never had the time. Uh, but with Meg being out of town for the last week, uh, Aaron had a little bit of free time. So <laughs> it was good. I had a lot of fun. And that was super cool. Somebody asked me what I did. What did you do, John? Oh my god, Nikki, I'm so glad you asked. In the same vein of Aaron reaching Legend and Hearthstone, I am mid-gold in Overwatch right now. Fuck Activision Ooh. Blizzard. They're all pieces of shit. But I'm mid-gold in comp right now, and that's the highest I've ever been. And it was for the same exact reason that Aaron was able to get Legend. Because there was nobody here this week. So all <laughs> I did was work, stream, and play Overwatch. Nice. So I'm gold, and I'm so happy. Well, mid gold, I should say. It's the highest I've ever been, and we're rising, homies. We're just, rising, uh, just high enough to start getting into those toxic games. Oh, uh, I, yeah. I mean, silver is extremely toxic to begin with. Gold is a little bit better, but once we reach platinum, <laughs> oh, the stuff that they say. 
<laughs> at least it's It's your league. fault! Uninstall. <laughs> Assholes. At least I don't play League. Right? Who'd play League? Yeah. Not me. Don't do it, Nikki. If you ever, ever, I f- ever I fucking wanted would to. never play don't League of it. Legends. I've played it once. And then I said no. League of Legends I'm going more to like a happy life. LOL. Am I right? <laughs> Nikki's a Minecraft girl. We all know that. And that's You are fair. correct. <laughs> and with that, let's get on to our first segment, which is Global News. all of our listeners can probably guess we're going to be starting off global news on a major fucking down note as we say meatloaf marvin lee a day who passed away on january 20th 2022 at the age of 74 meek grew up in dallas where he was a member of both the football team and the drama club a true double threat much like Corey monteith himself he moved to la after high school to start a band so he worked as a barista worse uh, a parking lot attendant but his theater nerd roots ultimately ended up being crazy useful when he landed a role in the la production of hair which led to a recording contract with motown he recorded his first album with sean murphy in 1971 titled what you see is what you get an album track that was released as a single in advance of the record making it to number 71 on the billboard top 100 chart The next year, Meatloaf became an OG cast member of an off-Broadway show called Rainbow, next auditioning for a role in a production called More Than You Deserve. That audition was where he met his partner in crime, Jim Steinman, for the first time. Besties! In 1973, as he was working in the Shakespeare in the Park production of Shakespeare's As You Like It, Meatloaf auditioned and was cast as both Eddie and Dr. Scott in the original L.A. Roxy cast of the Rocky Horror Show. Fun fact, in the original London production, Richard O'Brien himself initially wanted to play Eddie, but Jim Sharman, the director and producer, wanted to cast him as Rip, so they ended up casting Patty O'Hagan instead. So in 1973, the show came to L.A. and Meatloaf was hired as Skeddy, and according to an interview he did with VH1, he was cast largely because he was one of the only people who could get through the song. Meat stated... They come to me on the part of Hot Patootie, and Richard O'Brien is here at these rehearsals. He said, on this song, you'll never be able to get all the words in. I wrote it, and I can't sing all the words. I looked at him and said, I can sing all the words. Nobody could ever get in and just make those words fly through it. I just love telling people I can do that, and then being able to do it. There was another funny anecdote during that interview, where Meatloaf admitted to almost leaving the play altogether during rehearsals. Apparently, he got a little bit intimidated at the idea of men walking around in fishnet stockings. Meat stated, It's not like you were getting rich as an actor in New York. I didn't really say, what's the play about? Somebody said, we'll pay you 270 so I'm there, babe. During early <laughs> rehearsals, none of the cast knew what the play was about, only the songs they were doing. Tim didn't arrive in America until late in rehearsals, and he showed up in full costume and makeup. It was the first time the rest of the cast heard Sweet Transvestite. I literally get up and walk out of the theater, and I turn to Graham Jarvis, who played the narrator, going, I'm gone, I'm not doing this, I'm out of here. But Graham Jarvis was able to talk Meat into staying for the rehearsal, and even convince him to put on the fishnets he'd later wear as Dr. Scott. Apparently, Meat was not on board with this until the first night of previews when he got a response from the audience. I got this blanket on my lap, and I got these fishnet stockings and these high heels, garter belt, this black underwear on... I bring my leg up, and the audience, I've never heard such laughter in my life. And if you know me, and you know my personality, I will always go for the laughs. The Rocky Horror Show ran in L.A. for nine months, after which time Michael White and Lou Adler decided to turn the play into a picture show. Meat was asked to return to play the part of Eddie, but was a bit miffed when he learned that the production team would be bringing in Jonathan Adams to play Dr. Scott. Meat stated... I thought I was going to do Eddie and Dr. Scott, the same as in the play, and then they said, we're going to have somebody else do Dr. Scott. I said, you're making a huge mistake. And I still think they did, even though the actor was fine. The way it was in the play, Eddie and Dr. Scott looked alike, so you knew it was his nephew. I was a very good Dr. Scott. Honestly, I'm sorry that we missed out on that performance. Jonathan Adams was fantastic, but it definitely would have been funny as shit to see Meatloaf in that role. For sure. The rest, as they say, is history. 
After Rocky, Meat wrote and recorded Bad Out of Hell with Jim Steinman, which was released in 1977. That album launched his rock career, and he became a superstar. But we are all very grateful for Meat's theatrical roots, which allowed us all the opportunity to see him portray our favorite pizza delivery boy. Our community absolutely would not have been the same without his enormous talent and contribution. That said, we would also be remiss if we didn't touch on Meat's actual passing. Meatloaf died of covid since the start of the pandemic, Meat was a very outspoken anti-vaxxer and anti-masker and frequently opened up to the press about how if I die, I die, but I'm not going to be controlled. And Meatloaf was an incredibly talented performer, and although his passing is tragic, could have been very easily prevented. And we know most of our listeners are probably vaccinated already, but if you're not, we urge you to reconsider. If you've been planning to get your booster shot but haven't had time yet because you've been busy, please make it a priority. It's contagious out there, and we love you and want to keep you safe. And to Meatloaf, our show, and probably even a lot of our lives, would not have been what they are now had you not gotten amazingly comfortable with those fishnet stockings and put on one hell of a show. We appreciate everything you've done for us, and we'll see you on the other side. I do want to say one thing before we wrap up on this Meatloaf thing. Did you guys have a show on Friday? Well, we did, and obviously the news of Meatloaf's passing broke on Thursday. I have never experienced something like I experienced on Friday. So first of all, it's January in New Jersey. People aren't coming out in droves to see Rocky Horror, especially now of all times. People came out in, it was in, like the amount of people that we got on Friday was crazy. And at Ledin, they played Paradise by the Dashboard Light just to kind of like honor him. Everyone was standing up in their seats and screaming the lyrics and dancing and dancing with strangers. And then when Hot Patootie happened, there was not a second in the theater where it was quiet. The entire song, people were screaming and clapping. I mean, like all AP stopped and it was just cheering on Kat, who was playing Eddie that night. And everyone was freaking out from the moment he got on to the moment he died. The entire audience was screaming. And I can, like, I don't think I'll ever replicate the applause that we got after Hot Patootie. It was, like, it honestly, I was on stage, like, with a tear in my eye just because of, like, how insane it was. Man, I think that's a a good summary of Meat's life uh, right there. From the moment he got on until the minute that he died, the entire audience was screaming. Literally. For one reason or another. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but yeah thank you mr loaf we will miss you so much i gotta see him in concert once did you really cool. mm-hmm. yeah back when i was in college um my girlfriend at the time my roommate who was our rocky and my dad uh all drove about like two hours to a casino uh to go see him perform uh there it was before he was like, you know, huffing and puffing on stage. So he was still able to put on a really great show. Uh, my girlfriend at the time wore my Eddie jacket uh, and went up and, you know, there was there was space in front of the stage. But like this was at a casino. So it was mostly like just old people sitting around. So we were like, fuck that. We're going to go up to the stage and like actually get a stand there. So we did like five feet away from Meatloaf <laughs> while he's That's singing. So it cool. was just, Yeah, it was super cool. It was super cool. He noted he noticed her in her jacket and, you know, pointed her out and all this. It was it was super fun. I it's one of my favorite memories uh of of just something I did related to Rocky and like, you know, so happy I got to do it with my dad and it was it was super fun. So yeah. Thanks, Meat. Unfortunately, we have to follow that up with some more sad news. Jesus. What the fuck? I thought this was a closed studio. Hello, party people. I come to you today with sad news. Next time, could you come with a bell, too? Jesus Christ. Daddy Barry passed away. Probably. I I think. Maybe? Jacob, Barry Bostwick did not pass away. Uh Yeah, I think. Well, there was news about his tombstone, and if Barry wants to steal meat spotlight even after death, who am I to stop him? No, Jacob, Barry made a comment about what his obituary would say. He didn't die. Oh, that's awkward. Yeah, maybe you'd like to bow out now? No, I mean, weird for Barry. Can you imagine talking about what your obit is going to say? It's like he's expecting to die soon. Maybe it's all the doom and gloom I've been whispering into his ears through the vents in his bathroom. Why are you hiding in Barry Boswick's bathroom vents? 
Uh, well, he was prescribed Xanax, but I knew that wasn't really his vibe, so I changed them out for sugar pills, but I got worried he would notice, so each morning I've been sneaking in there to change the top pill out for a Zoloft. Zoloft and Xanax are, are not even remotely similar. Why not just swap out the whole bottle? Well, then I wouldn't get to smell the breakfast on his breath every morning. Sometimes it's sausage. Andrea will not like this. Andrea knows. As Jacob is trying to tell us in his own special way, Barry just had a Rocky-themed interview ahead of his appearance in Orlando at Villacon to host a screening of Rocky Horror with the local Rich Weirdos Shadowcast. A longtime RHPS fan and founding producer of the Rich Weirdos, Seth Kuberski, got to interview him. And other than commenting that Rocky Horror is something that is iconic and will be the lead line in my obituary, Barry had some not-so-creepy and poorly timed things to say. In wholesome highlights, Barry talked about how grateful and surprised he is by the everlasting nature of Rocky Horror. He said, What fascinates me is that we're on our third generation now. I'm talking to grandchildren who talk about their grandmother taking them to Rocky Horror. My grandma showed me Rocky Horror. Kind of weird. And perhaps a little creepily, he commented on the alienation of non-Rocky family members. And if the younger generation doesn't get it, they basically disown them. They kick them out of the family. Barry isn't hitting a lot of home runs on this one, is he? I believe in him. I mean, you would. He also talked about how his son, who is now at Cambridge, FaceTimed him with a bunch of his friends while they were all watching a screening of Rocky Horror on Halloween at Darwin College. As with most interviews, Barry also made the required statement about the otherness and inclusivity of Rocky Horror, saying, There's a reason why it's iconic. It talks about the other. I've always felt like the other, too. I think a lot of actors feel like the other. Some other highlights from the interview. Barry doesn't regret once in a while being cut and feels like it needed to go because it ruined the energy of the movie. But he does regret when Superheroes was cut, saying he thought it was the whole message of the movie. He also has a personal connection to superheroes and said, It was the last scene we shot. When they cut at the end of that, I was in tears because I had had such an amazing time. He said he really enjoys shock treatment, but thought it was ahead of its time. It was a statement about the future that we weren't quite ready to explore. We didn't really even have the mental, emotional vocabulary to understand what Richard was trying to say. And extra wholesome, Barry really loved the 2016 Fox remake because he thought Curry's involvement was really good for him. I think it really raised his spirits. I thought just simply from the standpoint that he was involved was well worth the effort. Now this isn't a piece about Barry's online store, but he did try to sell us something. So Barry was recently involved in Viral Vignettes, which is a series of short YouTube videos starring TV stars from the 70s and 80s from the Actors Fund. There are 10 videos, about 5-10 minutes each, and each of them feature different stars, like Barry, on Zoom calls with each other, poking fun at all of our Panda Express issues. Now, they're trying to get the funding to turn it all into a movie, and as Barry says, if you are given a certain amount of money, they will write a 3-5 to five minute Zoom show, and I will act with them in it. You can have them write a play, I'll act with you on Zoom, and then you can put it on your IMDb page. So, loaded actors with bare resumes... Here's your shot. Or crazed fans with the money to fund a personal meet and act moment with Barry Bostwick. So, Aaron? I may or may not be looking into this. It's all being looked at. My people will talk to his people. So, Meg, Meg, I need you to talk to Barry. Lastly, Barry had some fun thoughts about our callbacks. I think Richard O'Brien once said, we need more wit and less shit when it comes to the callbacks. And he's right. If you don't have anything to say that is smart or clever, just keep your mouth shut. And about the audiences that he's recently observed, the only people who are talking to the screen are the cast members. The audiences aren't that hip to it, and they're just there to watch other people show off. They've become more observers as opposed to participants. Which, honestly, I think is really insightful about the callback trend in Rocky Horror Culture. Seriously. That about wraps up Barry's interview. We wish the best to our very own Madman FDR, and hope not to see him in the obits anytime soon. Last up in global news, while not strictly Rocky related, we thought we'd end out the segment on a bit of a high note with some absolutely thrilling news from one of our community faves, John Cameron Mitchell. For those of you who are just waking up from being in a 30 year long coma, or perhaps you've recently rejoined civilization after having spent the past three decades living in the woods, 
John Cameron Mitchell created and starred in Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which we all assumed would be the pinnacle of his career. Because what the fuck are you going to do that tops creating one of the most iconic and emotionally gripping rock and roll cult stage show turned films of all time? Like, that's got to be your peak, right? Wrong! You're so fucking wrong. You couldn't be more wrong if you had your head shoved up your butt. Hedwig who? Never heard of her. This role puts that little nothing of a character to shame. On Thursday, March 3rd, 2022, Peacock TV will be dropping all eight episodes of its new series titled Joe vs. Carol, starring John Mother Cameron fucking Mitchell as Joe motherfucking exotic and Kate McKinnon as the ultimate black widow, Carol Baskin. This docudrama promises to be, quote, a wild ride into the story of people who live very extreme lives. The show will follow that bitch Carol Baskin as she begins her epic roller coaster of a rivalry with Joe Exotic, demonstrating her ruthlessness to expose Joe as, I, I, I don't, I don't know, a shitty tiger breeder or something, while also delving into her own horrific past whereupon we may or may not find out that she may or may not have fed her husband to some tigers, which we all know she did, like a million percent, for sure, absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. That guy is definitely Tiger Poops. If you guys haven't already checked out the promo materials for this show, we've linked the trailer for you in our show notes. But if that's too much trouble, please do yourself a favor and at least do a quick Google search of the pictures. I couldn't think of a funnier person to play Joe Exotic. These photos of John Cameron Mitchell decked out in the most absurd hillbilly gear you've ever seen is hilarious and perfect all at the same time. And Kate McKinnon, looking like a lunatic hippie cat lady murderer, is solid gold. The way the show is being plugged, it makes it seem like they're trying to do, like, a straight drama, where these two will be portraying their characters in, like, total earnest. But obviously, they're both comedic actors who are playing roles that are so fucking over-the-top insane, there's no way this isn't going to be funny as fuck. Again, all eight episodes will be dropping on Peacock on March 3rd. We're super excited about this show, and we hope you guys are too. We'll definitely be watching it and reporting back, and if you check it out too, please let us know what you thought. I won't lie. So when just earlier this month, Meg and I got to go see John Cameron Mitchell in concert, and a bunch of people from RKO came down, uh, Rowan and Harley and 13 and everyone. He did a bit during his performance that was a song as Joe Exotic, and he came out in, like, you know, the Joe Exotic, like, gear and, and dressed up. I was so confused what was happening and why this was a thing. It, it, all, it all became very clear to me now why, why that happened. That's nice, Aaron. <laughs> and with that, let's go to uh, community news. So I know we say this, like, every time, but up next, we have something really different. Oftentimes, we're talking about Rocky casts or Rocky fans or communities of Rocky people jamming with the larger Rocky scene in one way or another. But for the first time, we have a piece about a massive group of virgins interacting with the show. And no, it's not some porno Jacob mistakenly wrote a whole segment about. I double-checked. A giant Twitch chat of mostly Rocky virgins got to watch another Rocky virgin watch Rocky Horror. Ooh, meta. Mm-hmm. That's right. Rocky is so good, people Twitch stream themselves watching that shit. Popular streamer Julian has 492,000 YouTube subs, 678,000 Twitch followers, and a whopping 1.1 million Instagram followers. And he recently streamed him and some friends watching Rocky Horror. Julian used to work at a radio station before meeting Jenna Marbles, who is a very prolific internet personality and content creator who rose to popularity on YouTube. Out of his relationship with her, he became a streamer and now has a massive following. He streams Animal Crossing, Dead by Daylight, Mario, as well as a lot of stuff in the zeitgeist like Among Us and whatever else is popular right now. So John, you're a streamer, right? Uh-huh. Julian's a streamer and you're a streamer. Yes. You're both streamers. Yeah. Are you two related? What? Nikki, I'm surprised at you. I find that racist. 
Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just asking. Well, it's a touchy subject. No, not all streamers are related. What are you trying to say, huh? That we all share the same Twitch chat? Hmm? Hmm? Uh, hmm? uh no, 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 someone, Aaron, Aaron, would you take this? So, Julian is a rocky virgin, some of his friends are too, and certainly a lot of his chat is. So it was kind of awesome to get to see such a variety of virgins reacting to Rocky Horror. There was Julian reacting in real time on the stream to the movie, and there was everyone else typing in the chat, so we got to see what it was like for so many people seeing this show for the first time. And here are some highlights from the chat stream. She, Janet... Looks kind of like Carol Baskin, followed quickly by, who said she looks like Carol Baskin? My favorite, this movie is so much better with alcohol. This is like Twilight. My personal favorite, none of the Virginia viewers are ready for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> just, just the ones from Virginia. It's a rough state, man. <laughs> yeah, it really is. When the time warp started, there were a lot of spam GIFs of dancing cats and robots, dancing everything. I believe there was a lot of spammed GIFs, but I'll give it to you, Nikki. Shut the fuck up, Aaron. I never would have watched this on my own, and now I'm happy. Followed by at time warp, this is what LGBT parties look like. Not wrong. For Sweet Tea, a lot of people spamming clapping hands and a lot of requests for Tim Curry to step on them. How have I not seen this before? This is so good. Is that your Twitch chat voice? Yeah. <laughs> you don't... Aaron has heard my Twitch chat voice. <laughs> Wait, what the fuck? During creation scene, why is this Teletubbies vibes? <laughs> <laughs> For, so there's this one. Frank is twisting all the knobs, right, during creation, and liquid is pouring into the tank. And someone wrote, Finally, gender fluid. <laughs> using that one which is actually really good i'm gonna steal that one too yeah That's nice uh when we first see rocky after sword of damocles some someone said he missed all leg days and <laughs> do a squat nerd then there's wait why does he frank not like eddie <laughs> that because was hilarious like, it's because true it was... they don't talk about it at all in the movie he just shows up and frank is immediately mad <laughs> <laughs> um you're telling me he stuck it in that quick, but she's a virgin? That's a Twitch chat comment. For elbow sex, uh, <laughs> one Twitch chat viewer said, I thought they were going to high five. Close. Little dirtier. Is this where he sings Hopelessly Devoted to You? Oh, fuck that song, man. Is this whole movie about sex? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Mom, I need you to pick me up. People are touching and singing. Noisemaker? I hardly blew her! What the literal actual fuck? I just watched the Conjuring series, and this movie is by far the scariest one I have ever seen. What are you doing, Step Eddie? Correction, Eddie was your nephew. <laughs> uh, I have to wiki the plot now? Why is Riff getting hotter the longer this movie goes on? Facts. Facts, he does. <laughs> Anyone else part of a shadow cast? Come see us in Michigan. When Janet and Columbia get stoned and their tits are out, the chat had a lot of fun. Bahongas, the nips, cooter. You can tell it's the 70s because nobody trimmed the bush. Ah, Twitch chat. And this is how the Rocky movies were created. He became a boxer out of anger and hate and destroyed all those who stood against him. They are aliens, LMAO! Isn't Transylvania on Earth? This literally sounds like my Twitch chat at any given fucking evening. Right? <laughs> this entire thing. Julian, of course, had an awesome stream, and he was wearing some Moroccan shades and was covered in what looked like fake blood and makeup for the whole movie. He really enjoyed the movie. He was laughing at a lot of stuff, which reminded me that there are things in the show that can catch people off guard. It gets so predictable after the 100th Friday show, it's easy to forget how surprising the movie can be. For instance, Julian and everyone else talking on the stream was just in hysterics for Rocky Roll Call. When Frank slips into Brad's bed, Julian literally goes, Oh my god, 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 this is amazing, oh my god. I can't remember having that much of a reaction to anything since at least one whole pepperoni pizza ago. 
This this was just such a great stream, and it was so cool to see Rocky Horror being enjoyed by so many people who just wouldn't have interacted with it otherwise. It's always great to see new people getting drawn into the fold. Julian loved the show so much, clapping at the end and literally saying, that was so good, oh my god. I don't know what movie he was watching, but we wish him the best in life and streaming, and perhaps he'll find himself in a midnight theater sometime soon. Uh, along with some of his Twitch viewers. Did I hear Michigan Road Trip? That's great and all, but it's time for some real news. Have you guys ever wondered what it would be like if Wizards of the Coast made a Rocky Horror-themed Magic the Gathering set? <sighs> Fucking nerd. Oh my god, please, really? Are they doing it? Oh my god, really? That sounds real gay. Well, wonder no longer, because it's here. Wizards of the Coast just released a double feature set. The set is a mashup of the last two sets, which were vampire and then werewolf heavy. Every card is in black and white, and the whole thing is deliberately reminiscent of old monster horror movies of the 60s and 70s. Remind you of anything, huh? 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 I feel like this has nothing to do with Rocky Horror. Yes. Anyway, the cards are really cool, and if you think really hard, you can imagine some of the Rocky characters are on the cards. So I'm going to talk about some of the highlights. This okay. has nothing to do with Rocky Horror. Uh, yes, but I'm still going to enjoy myself, and you have to listen. So the first card is actually this guy, and he sort of looks like Riff Raff. It's called Faithful Absinthe, and it costs one and a white, and he's like hunts over a coffin. And if you imagine really hard, it sort of looks like what it would be like if Eddie, after he died, got out of his coffin, and then when they went to dinner... Riff Raff opened up the coffin and Nettie wasn't there. Why are um, you talking like this? The next one? Because I'm reviewing magic cards. That's how you talk when you review magic cards. Pretty Maybe simple don't. and straightforward. This okay, the next so... one I really like is... Oh, God. It looks like... It looks kind of like Frankenfurter because it's like a scientist. Um, and he's standing in front of like a zombie. And he has like two power cables. And he's like his creation. So it's like if Frankenfurter was kind of steampunk and just made Rocky Horror. And Rocky was also a steampunk Rocky version of himself. He knows we hate this. Yeah. This Meg, is can I do a pickup with like a timestamp for when this is over? <laughs> <laughs> the next one I thought was really cool because it reminded me it's two werewolves fighting. It's called Duel for Dominance and it's like the two werewolves on the card are dueling for dominance. And it reminded me of what it would be like if Rocky was a werewolf and also Eddie was a werewolf and they had a werewolf fight. This um, is not. I thought that was really cool. Close yes, but it's really cool. It's really hard. fun. If you just let it enjoy yourself, you would enjoy it. Okay. Um, the next one I really liked because it reminded me of Riff Raff. It's like this, this a... really gay looking person and they have a sword and they're standing in the window of a castle just like Riff Raff is standing in the window of a castle at the beginning of the movie. So it's just like Riff Raff. It's called Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. It's obviously like a reference to Rocky, clearly. I thought um, so like the end was a fucking stretch and then we have to listen to this. Uh, <laughs> the next one I really liked is an image of what looks like Janet because it's like this really distraught girl on her bed and like there's this like sex monster behind her so it's like what Janet was looking like right after she, she had sex with Frank and she's like really sad and regretful of what just happened but the monster is just like there and he's just like oh yeah I just had sex I mean I'm the card is called Eruth Tormented Prophet really good Um, the next one that I really liked is Actually, a vi an image of, like, a guy with, like, a mace, and he's, like, he's gonna fight the bad guys. He's called Torrens, Fifth of the Angels, and it reminded me of what Brad thinks he looked like in his mind when he said, it's all right, Janet, in creation scene. So, obviously a reference to that. Uh, um, <sighs> the next one I really liked Why is... Why is this a segment? <laughs> Who signed off on this? <laughs> This is a woman in a ball gown and a funny hat. The next one, I really like this one. I really like this one. It's what Frank looks like in his head if he had superpowers and he was a woman and he could fly and he was a vampire. He's like Jake, in a castle Jacob, looking place Jake, and he's Jake? like flying and, and it's very cool. There's like vapors around him. He's doing exactly what he would do. It's this called isn't Olivia Frank Crimson Bride. Her name is fucking Olivia. This is Crimson a girl. Bride. She works Crimson down the Crimson Bride. If Frank wanted to be a bride, he'd be a Crimson Bride. That's all I'm saying. It's very obvious. The next card I really liked is another one that looks sort of like Riff Raff. Um, it's called Delver of Secrets. He's very old and he's holding like a brain in a jar, which is exactly something Riff Raff would do. It costs one blue and he's a 1-1. One, one. Very admirable. Just this like Riff Raff. This one kind of looks like Riff. I'll Why? give Jacob Thank that. you very much. You see? But, you see? But, it's but, all the reference to Rocky Har. Jacob, Delver's a flip card. Why didn't you review the backside of it as well? 
Um, because uh, why, Aaron? That, that, <laughs> that's a good question. Jacob, what I, the so fuck is cards. this next I one? <laughs> what is going on right now? Oh my god! The ne- oh my god! The next one is my favorite one. I okay, fucking so hate one, this. The next one is called boop, 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 unnatural moonrise, and on the card is just a bunch of werewolves with their like beady little eyes looking at you, and it reminded me that a lot of cats go to a Denny's after <laughs> the show. And when you go to Denny's, you have that, like, hungover midnight 1 a.m. look. And you're like, mm, I want food. Just like these werewolves in the card want to eat you. So it's clearly a reference to Kath going to Denny's after the show. It's right in the card. This this might be the, the show that I leave the show. Mm-hmm. This, like, his voice started with just kind of, like, an offensive lisp. And now he's gone, like, full Billy Madison. Offensive? This is how I talk. No, God. It's not. Okay, and the last one, I like this one the most. Thank it reminded God. me of the castle. It's called Hostel, Hot, Hot, Hostel, Hostel, Hostel. Yes, and uh-huh. it's a house, but mm-hmm. when you turn it around, it's a house that's a line, so it can hurt you, and it's actually painful, just like the Frankenfurter castle. This is a fucking nightmare. That's what the. What Thank the you. fuck is this? What the fuck was that? What I is mean, going on? This last one is at, it's at least a house. Aaron? Jacob, maybe take a podcast out to dinner first before you fuck it in the ass. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Aaron, control yourself. But I do like Magic the Gathering and- Aaron, you're <sighs> embarrassing all of us. Now that we're out of the Barry and MTG segments of the show, it's time for me to bow out and go back to my little cave. I leave you nerds to the rest of the show. I have some black market Zoloft to buy. Good fucking riddance. (laughs) Oh my god. Last but certainly not least in community news, we have a write-in from our bestie, Sam the Hobo, over at JCCP. Wait, oh my god, can I say something about JCCP before we get into this? Because me and Joey came up with this last night, and I need to tell the entire community. Before we get into this JCCP stuff, I have a general question for the entire cast of JCCP, especially Sam the Hobo, and I need some answers. When a leadership member of JCCP is addressing the greater cast as a whole, do you refer to them as JCC people? That is my question. I think they're just yins. JCC people? Yins. JCC people? Nikki has clearly (laughs) never been to Pittsburgh. So Sam writes, hello. We wanted to let yins, there it is, Nikki, and all the beautiful listeners out there know that on February 5th, the Junior Chamber of Commerce Players is putting on an epic double feature of Shock Treatment and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. The Pittsburgh cast is so excited to put on John's favorite show, Shock Treatment, at 9 p.m., Fuck You, Sam, and Rocky to follow at midnight. Tickets can be bought at the Hollywood Theater website. The theater and cast are also doing a promotion of buy a popcorn and drink for Shock Treatment and get a free refill and a prop bag for Rocky if you get tickets to both. Oh, thank God my finances are solved for this trip. Shut up, you're rich. The JCCP also guarantees some extra special guests for the shows. Also, keep a lookout for some of the other extra special shows in the near future. All information can be found on the Junior Chamber of Commerce Players website and social medias at JCCPPGH. Thanks, and see yins soon. Ooh, well, that's going to be fun. I wonder who their special guests possibly could be. Yeah, who are they going to be? I don't know. Are you guys going to be there? I'm not fucking going anywhere. Well, Meg and I just might be there. <gasps> I uh, I just might be there with my bestie, Andrea. And let me just say, I am so excited to meet all of you JCC people. Oh, uh, well, rumor has it that we might have some friends from Buffalo coming in and some other friends from out in New Jersey. I think Something there's... like ordinary kids? Yo, that's like four whole casts that are going to be at this show. No, literally, it is four casts, one show. I've seen that porn before. That's how I'm paying for con, baby. Yeah, it is. Let's go royalties. So there's going to be a separate floor show casting and a ton of Transylvanians for your Rocky Horror heart to desire no more. 
yeah we're already preparing for our trip like we're we're getting our costumes together figuring out how to fit them in our suitcases all that other crap you know good a good uh good uh dry run for uh can for rko con later this year and there's a lot more really fun stuff on the horizon everyone who is involved in this show from what i've been told is like sworn to secrecy but if you like traveling to see other casts perform fun stuff, it might be worth looking into traveling to Pittsburgh for the not-so-distant future. And if you do, I hear that there's free popcorn refills for the second movie. That's such a cute idea. So if you're in or around the Pittsburgh area... <laughs> so if you're in or around the Pittsburgh area and somehow don't already know about this show, we've got the Hollywood Theater website linked for you in the show notes. Please check it out, get your tickets, get your free popcorn refill, and come say hi to us. We're really excited about this show and can't wait to get to go have fun with such an amazing group of performers. Good luck, JCC people. We love you. And with that, let's move on over to our last segment. Nikki asks a question. Nikki asks a question. Nikki asks a question. Nikki asks a question. So before we kick off this snack snack, I actually want to do a quick piece of community news, if you don't mind. We just finished community news, though. You can't just keep going after you finish. Maybe you can't. What does that even mean, Nikki? You know what it means. So just the other day, on the 22nd, Scott Michaels, writer and creator of the Dearly Departed Tours sightseeing excursion in Hollywood, posted a YouTube video talking about Meatloaf on the set of Rocky Horror. Scott Michaels. Why is that name familiar? Yeah, what's so special about this video? So for those of you like Nikki who think that name's familiar, you're totally right. Scott Michaels wrote Rocky Horror from Concept to Cult. It's one of the best resources for doing research about Rocky Horror. In it, he interviews firsthand almost every single person who had anything to do with the original Rocky Horror show and the subsequent film. And on top of that, he interviews most of the Transylvanians, the production team, and just so many others. It's a fantastic resource, even if it's a little bit scattered. I knew I'd heard that name before. I wrote my senior year capstone on that book. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay so the video it's called meatloaf rocky horror stunt gone wrong dearly departed tours oh okay this is gonna be about the accidents that happened when filming hot patootie you got it so scott digs back through his rocky horror archive and comes up with a fantastic overview of the stories and memories that the cast remembers when they were shooting hot patootie and the accidents that happened on set this is all involving Ken Shepard and Meatloaf. He also shows off some really fantastic scans of the call sheets that he has from the specific days where they were shooting Hot Patootie. He got those courtesy of the late Transylvanian, Sadie Corey. I don't think we've seen many of these actually published before. These are super cool. I didn't know a bunch of this stuff. My favorite, apparently the set dressing team used hot wax all over the bike and Meatloaf to make the frost and ice. Crazy. Yeah, we're eventually going to do a follow-up to our episode where we talked about Frank and Rocky's stunt doubles do something specific for Ken Shepard and Meatloaf. But I think Scott scooped us on this one. It's a fun watch, and it's really well put together. If you want a 10-minute journey through all the different stories about what happened with the motorcycle, who got hurt, and how, and even some Transylvanian drama, definitely go check out Scott's newest video over on the Daily Departed Tours YouTube channel. It'll be linked for you in our show notes. Can we get back on schedule now? Nikki time! So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode and last week, I was so pumped to finally perform as Riff with my cast, the Friday Night Specials, for the first time. And I was thinking back about the whole process that I went through to get ready and practice and audition and all that. I, I don't hear a question in there, Nikki. Well, okay. So, on FNS, when you want to do a role, obviously you join as one role and that's your general audition. So to play any of the other roles, there really isn't an audition process because you've kind of already shown that you're capable. So you have to reach out to the director and the trainer with the role that you want to play. So you set up rehearsal time and then you have to get your costume together. And once your trainer and you together feel ready, you can debut. It could take a month. It could take six months. It doesn't. It's, it, it's up to you and your trainer. 
Yeah, I'm 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 still not hearing a, a question here. I think this is just Nikki's big dick story time. Uh, I, she's really bitter that you cut into her knack snack time. Jesus, impatient much, guys. You've got to let me get through all the foreplay before we get to the good bit. Sorry, Nikki. Foreplay? Must be nice, am I right? So anyway, I was thinking about how much I worked to practice and eventually get on stage and all the effort and time and preparation, and it got me thinking about what the auditions must have been like for the original stage show. There it is. Yep, found it. So anyway, what was it like for Tim Curry and Patricia Quinn and everyone else to audition for Rocky? And what about those stories we've heard about Nell tap dancing on the street and Tim running into Richard coming from the gym and just all that? I want to know how everyone got cast. I mean, from what I know, you'd be surprised to find out that it was a lot less rigorous than what you went through auditioning for Riff. So uh, let's set the stage here. I hate you. In the mid-60s, Richard O'Brien had just moved to London from New Zealand, as you do, and is for all intents and purposes a struggling actor. He does stunt work in the 1967 James Bond film Casino Royale, but acting jobs are few and far between. Meanwhile, still in Australia, Jim Sharman is making a name for himself directing shows all over the country. In 1968, the American-imported tribal love rock musical Hair opens in London, with Tim Curry in the cast alongside Richard O'Brien. And work picks up for everyone throughout the late 60s and early 70s. Charmin is directing more and more shows and eventually collaborating with designer Brian Thompson in 1969, nice, for a production of Hair. At the time, Thompson was an architectural student and aspiring designer who Charmin met through friends at Sydney's Hamburger Heaven Takeaway. Okay, so by the late 60s, Richard O'Brien and Tim Curry have met, and Jim Charmin and Brian Thompson have started directing and designing plays together in Australia. Makes sense. As the 60s come to a close, Richard O'Brien finds more work on stage, and Tim Curry quickly becomes a rising star. Lots of Shakespeare and shows at the Citizens Theatre in Glasgow, including The Maids, a show with costumes designed by Sue Blaine. This was the show she would later contact in order to reuse the corset that Tim wore as Frank. In May of 1972, Charmin directs the Australian tour Jesus Christ Superstar with designs by Brian Thompson. The pair, now an inseparable powerhouse of Australian theater. In August, Charmin and Thompson take Superstar to London, and their production opens at the Palace Theater. Charmin casts Richard O'Brien in a chorus role in Superstar. Their shared interests and upbringing make them fast friends. It was also working on Superstar that they all first met Richard Hartley. Okay, so everyone here kind of already knew each other. There wasn't any auditioning or anything? We are losing track of my thread. I I promise we'll get to audition soon. Charmin and Thompson were handed the opportunity to work on American playwright Sam Shepard's one-act play, The Unseen Hand. The venue, which is the theater upstairs at the Royal Court Theater. Richard Hartley did the music, and O'Brien and Christopher Malcolm took on two of the lead roles. Oh, sure. Just handed a Sam Shepard play to do at the Royal Court Theater because you're all successful and good at theater and famous. Also, I know who Christopher Malcolm is. He played Brad. It's during The Unseen Hand that Richard O'Brien pitches the rough plot and music that he has amassed to Jim Sharman. That's what would eventually be molded into Rocky Horror. Jim Sharman signs on and convinces Michael White to produce the show, and then everyone is off to the races. Jillian Diamond was the resident casting director at the theater upstairs, and she set out organizing auditions for the actors. Finally, auditions! So Brad Majors was easy. Charmin had loved Christopher Malcolm's work in The Unseen Hand and offered him the role of Brad. In a 1999 BBC radio interview, Malcolm confessed that originally, the story had been pitched to him from the perspective of Brad and Janet, and he was under the impression that Brad was the central character. Only during rehearsals, when he first witnessed Tim Curry's vibrant performance, did he realize, "Uh uh-oh, there's a better role than this. Seriously? How did Jim Sharman spin that story to pitch it to Malcolm? Rocky Horror, oh yeah. It's all about Brad Majors. He's a guy, a swell guy, and he's just out one night with his best gal, and well, things go all jeepers, Scoob. That's nice. He cast a dude that he had worked with before. Boring. Let's get to the good stuff. What about Frank? Well, according to Richard O'Brien, the first choice to play Frankenfurter had actually been Jonathan Kramer, an American actor who had appeared in the Broadway production of Hair. You know I meant Tim Curry, damn it. However, 
As happenstance, O'Brien would find his Frank while out hunting for a Rocky. Finding a muscle man that could sing was proving a challenge and one that Richard was eager to take on personally. He had been cruising local gyms looking for a blonde man with a tan, and it was on his way back from a gym that he ran into his old acquaintance from hair, Tim Curry. Oh yeah, auditioning guys at a gym. We get it, Richard. Did you have a casting couch too? Don't get a dirty mind, there are no stepsisters in this story. Just magenta that Richard literally made up to have sex with. That doesn't count. I can't with you people. So after explaining what Richard was looking for, Tim asked him, Why do you need the muscle man to sing? Richard told Tim that his musical was going to be done and suggested that he should talk to Jim Sharman, and he gave him a copy of the script. Meanwhile, Jillian Diamond was coordinating for auditions and wrangling all the actors that had been sent her way. She had an initial interview with Tim Curry in mid-April and through a recommendation from the theater upstairs manager, reached out to the agent of actor Rainer Burton about auditioning for Frank. Wait, so Tim Curry versus Rainer Burton for Frank? The creation versus his creator? Neither yet. Rainer met with Jillian Diamond, who again lamented her problem finding muscle men who could sing, but told Rainer she was still putting him forward for Frank. After he talked with Jillian, he went for drinks next door to meet up with a friend. Partway through the night, his friend notices an actor walk in who he had worked with at the Citizens Theater in Glasgow. They were introduced. Tim, this is Rainer Burton. Rainer, this is Tim Curry. Holy crap. You just get done talking about an audition and you go for a drink and literally your main competition walks in. I would cut a bitch. Tim mentioned that he had also spoken with Jillian about the role of Frank, but otherwise, the topic of Rocky didn't come up. Yeah, I bet it didn't. As for Magenta, rumor has it that the role was originally created for 1960s singer Marianne Faithful, one-time partner of Mick Jagger. Now, the timelines and details differ from account to account, but either way, Marianne Faithful ultimately declined the role. Richard Hartley came through here, suggesting that Pat Quinn, an elegant actress from Belfast, Northern Ireland, that Hartley had seen in a March production of Sarah B. Divine at the Cochrane Theatre in London. Must be nice to get all these references. Pat Quinn was already a fairly noted actress. In 1963, at the age of 19, she made her British television debut and had been acting on stage and screen for a decade by then. So in May, Tim Curry performs in a show called Give the Gaffers Time to Love You at the Royal Court Theatre. It's during production for this show that the agent for another one of the cast members of Give the Gaffers, Jonathan Adams, hears that the Rocky Horror producers were looking for a number of peculiar characters, including a mad professor that he thought Jonathan might work very well for. Adams' agent persuaded him to just go along and audition. Around the same time, Patty O'Hagan's agent told him that he should audition for the show, Rocky Horror, knowing nothing of what the musical was about. He did advise that Patty should take his saxophone in case they also needed band members. Must be nice to have an agent. So they just booked an audition through their agent, though it sounds like Patty's agent probably should have done some research, and Adam's agent hit it right on the head, as he would eventually play Dr. Scott in the film version after playing the narrator in the stage show. Meanwhile, Jim Sharman had convinced Richard O'Brien that he was best fit to play Riff Raff. Originally hoping to save the role of Eddie for himself, Richard relented, saying, quote, I was really nervous about the whole thing, but I respected Jim, and since he felt that I should play Riff Raff, I had to go along with him. Rainer Burton and Patricia Quinn both auditioned in a rented space at the Irish Club in London. Rainer recalls the venue in his autobiography. Upon arrival, I was taken up to the first floor where high solid wood double doors opened into the room hired for the Rocky Horror auditions. I remember that room as being huge, of rectangular shape with a high ceiling, wide ornate plaster coving, and two magnificent crystal chandeliers. Three Chesterfield leather sofas were at one end, surrounding a large glass coffee table on three sides. At the other end of the room was a piano. A few smaller pieces of furniture were dotted along the edges, with a large carpet dominating the central floor space. The walls were of a light color, festooned with paintings, save for the outside wall, which was boasted huge windows allowing streams of sunlight to flood in. Very bright, very airy, very gothic, a very good room to rehearse in. Not so good, however, to audition in, at least not from the actor's perspective. The actors who were in throes of auditioning could clearly see and be seen, and more embarrassingly be heard, by the other actors who were waiting to audition. Ugh, no, absolutely not. Don't put me up in front of everyone if I have to audition. 
Yeah, I mean, at New York, we always do auditions in, like, a separate space at the theater where we do it at, like, one of, like somebody's house or something like that. Like, you don't want to scare someone away before they even have the chance. It was right after Rayner took in the room that he first noticed the creative team. He recalled that they all appeared very young, very hip, and were all dressed casually in the streetwear of the day. When it came his turn, Rayner sang Long-Haired Lover from Liverpool, a Little Jimmy Osmond song that he had covered in a 1972 pantomime production. He remembered being introduced to Jim Sharman, Richard O'Brien, and Richard Hartley, and handed his sheet music to Richard Hartley. He began to sing, and after a single verse, Jim Sharman cut him off with a, Okay, thanks, that's enough of that. As he collected his sheet music from Richard Hartley, dejected, Sharman turned back to him. I'd like you to have a go at this. It's the song the character Rocky sings immediately after he's been brought to life by Frankenfurter, who is a transvestite from another planet, who's recently arrived on Earth with his entourage from transsexual Transylvania and created the perfect man in Rocky. Okay? Well, that's a 180. All right, go Rainer. Richard Hartley quickly played and sung it through, and then Rainer made an attempt at sort of Damocles. He had completed the first verse when Jim Sharman interrupted again. Okay, can you try it again, but this time, camp it up a bit. At this point, while collecting his thoughts, Richard O'Brien apparently looked straight back at Rainer, blew him a kiss, flicked his considerably long hair with his right hand over his right shoulder, and girlishly kicked his left leg backwards from the knee joint. God damn it, Richard. First the gyms, now this? Put on the spot and trying to think of a campy character, Rainer fell back on a role where he had raised his normal speaking voice by four octaves. Instinctively, he did the same with his singing voice and unintentionally sang the entirety of Sword of Damocles in falsetto. The creatives loved it, but nothing was decided on the spot. Rainer left just happy he had been allowed to finish the song. I bet. A week later, he received a call from his agent that they were interested, but they still hadn't decided on a role. Jillian Diamond called him a few days later, explaining that Richard was insistent on trying to find his mythical muscle man that could sing. But if they couldn't, Jim Sharman was gunning for Rainer. More days went by, and after a late night of partying, Rainer got the call the following morning in a hungover haze telling him that he had been cast as the role of Rocky. Well, that's the most relatable Rocky casting ever. Rainer later found out that during his audition, while he was still waiting for his turn, that Sharman had asked Jillian Diamond what role he was there for. Frankenfurter, replied Jillian. No, he's not. That's Rocky, said Sharman. Oh, God damn it! Of course. Patricia Quinn was also cast through the auditions at the Irish Club in London. She arrived at the Irish Club audition knowing only that she had to sing and that they would prefer to hear a rock and roll song. She met with Jim and the Richards and sang a rendition of Over My Shoulder, which is a number made famous by Jesse Matthews as the theme from the 1934 film Evergreen. You know, that old chestnut. (laughs) Pat claimed with her typical modesty that it was the only song that she knew all the words to. But Pat also dressed the part as well. Her husband, just days before the audition, had sent Quinn a package. (laughs) You said butt, Pat. A package containing a jacket (laughs) with leopard skin sleeves and a picture of the Taj Mahal on the back. She wore that jacket to the audition, and as she recounted in one interview, she said, At least I fitted in with those auditioning me, because that was Richard O'Brien in his teddy coat and his leather, and you don't usually find people like that who are auditioning you. Richard was wearing a teddy coat and leather? That makes Rainer's story so much worse. Damn it, Richard. Over My Shoulder, the song she sang, turned out to be a great fit. Pat later said it suited the part of the usherette singing science fiction. Richard played science fiction for me on the guitar at the audition, and he said, Can you just sing along with this a bit? I was very nervous, and I tried to. I thought they were rock and roll guys, and I didn't know how to do all this. Right, so that's where the story comes from that Richard had her sing science fiction, and she fell in love with it. Gotcha. Jim Sharman thought she would be a great fit for the Wistful Usherette. Quinn was eager to accept the role... Her agent, on the other hand, recommended caution, just in case the character turned out to be a four-line part. Which it was. When she got the script, she said, I don't give a shit. I'm going to do it because it's the best song I've ever heard. At times, Jonathan Adams, Patty O'Hagan, and Tim Curry all auditioned at the theater upstairs at the Royal Court. It's not quite clear what order it all happens in. 
We're talking about events unfolding over a few weeks here. Jonathan Adams recalled the audition in his autobiography that his agent phoned him one day and said he should go audition at the Royal Court Theater. Being a delightful storyteller, Adams' version of the phone call is pretty damn entertaining. Here, let's do a dramatic reading of this. John, you can be Jonathan Adams, and Nikki, you get to be his agent, Tom. It's at the Royal Court Theater. <laughs> Upstairs or downstairs, governor? That gloomy room? Why, am I gonna do Macbeth a frintin' after all with a bottle of water? Oh, shut up. I've got a lot of work to catch up on, bloody what? hell. What's it all about, then? What, what's all this, then? Sounds a bit indulgent to me. In it, there's a bodybuilder, a creature from outer space. I don't know why I'm Australian now. <laughs> an all-American couple, a mad professor. Suits you, shrimp on the barbie. Shut it. A rock and roll biker, a transvestire. <laughs> Is that supposed okay, to say transvestite? Oh, it's supposed to say transvestite, yeah. <laughs> a transvestire. A transvestite? Okay, I'll go. What time? Who do I need to talk to, mate? Richard O'Brien or Jim Shaman, bruv. N- Never heard of them, governor. <laughs> That's exactly how Jonathan Adams sounds. I, yeah. I like that the agent is from different places based on what he says. <laughs> Well, that might not be a completely accurate retelling of uh, that phone call. Who knows exactly how the conversation really went? I mean, Jonathan and Adam's version is a fun story. I think our version puts a cute spin on it, too. Well, la-dee-da, old Boomer Adams doesn't know about all these youths and their weird modern plays. I mean, that didn't stop him, though. At the theater upstairs, he played an old nightclub routine that he had devised in the 50s, a quirky rendition of Hey Ba Ba Black Sheep, sung at the piano in the style of a bunch of assorted composers. Adams described it as operatic parody. O'Brien and Sharman both liked Adams and felt that his ironic wit and deadpan delivery would be perfect for the show's narrator. Once Adams was cast, the narrator's role, which was at first just a single scene setting monologue, was significantly expanded in order to utilize the actor's talents more fully. As new songs and scenes were added during rehearsal, the narrator acquired more lines to link them together. And Patty O'Hagan did make sure to bring his saxophone to his audition. In Cosmic Light, Patty recalls that Jim Sharman sat at the back of the theater while Hartley and O'Brien conducted the auditions. O'Hagan said... It was almost the first audition I'd ever been to, and I didn't know what the hell to take for audition material, so I took some musicals. And I started doing a musical, and Richard O'Brien said, you don't sort of do rock and roll, do you? So I said, slightly, well, yeah, actually, I do, yeah. So they started playing away, and I sang a bit, and I got my saxophone out, so we started jamming for a bit. And then O'Brien said, I don't suppose by any chance you happen to be interested in early science fiction movies, do you? So then we started talking about it. I was meant to be there auditioning for about 10 minutes, and that went on for some time. And then I went out thinking, yeah, nice bunch of guys. And somebody said, oh, and by the way, if we offered you a part, would you accept it? So I went, yeah, absolutely. And in a purely economical move, they got two characters for the price of one actor. O'Hagan was double cast as Eddie and Dr. Scott, yet still paid the same as all the other performers, 18 pounds a week. All right, give me the goods. What about Tim's audition? Tim Curry's audition is basically a dream audition, all the way down to the details being a little fuzzy. According to Sharman's memoir, the moment that Tim Curry arrived at the Royal Court Theater and belted out a classic rock and roll song, Sharman knew instantly that he had found his Frank. What song it was that Tim sang, though, that's up for debate. It is most commonly reported that he auditioned with an amazing rendition of Tutti Frutti. Tim Curry himself has said so. Jim Sharman, on the other hand, vehemently says that the song in question was actually another Little Richard number, Rip It Up. In a 1975 interview with Film Talk, Tim Curry said about the show, When I read it, I just thought it was very, very funny and the most kind of economical script that I had read for a very long time. I was hesitant in that if it worked, it might be a difficult image to shake off, he confessed. But really, I have always thought that it wasn't worth doing unless you took a risk, really, so I just took the risk. That's a rather accurate and fortuitous statement. No wonder he was always so cagey in the early days about getting typecast as Frank for the rest of his career. 
As for Janet, Julie Covington's casting was a bit of a surprise. In 1973, Julie was an up-and-coming diva who had recently left the London production of Godspell. Among the ensemble of lesser-known actors, she was an impending star. So much so that it was her casting, along with the prodding from producer Michael White that the show was running a little short, that made Richard O'Brien decry that it would be a shame if she didn't get a solo number. And that's where Toucha comes from. And last but not least... Dear Columbia. Wasn't she found on the street or something? Well, that's the story, and it's often been repeated, but like all tall tales, it has some fragments of truth. According to the tale, Jim Sharman remembered a pink-haired, squeaky-voiced tap dancer he had seen busking outside London's Palace Theater whilst he was putting together Jesus Christ Superstar. Sharman, Thompson, and Hartley tracked Nell down to Smalls, which is the Knightsbridge restaurant where she waited tables while tap dancing. There, she was offered the part of Columbia. And is it true? You know, it used to be that I had to avoid answering this question, or it, or at least citing a vague version of that legend. But thanks to OzRockyHorror.com and a newspaper article from shortly after the Rocky Horror Picture Show was released, we actually have the answer to this in Nell's own words. Why don't you read it, Nikki? Let, let you answer your own question. Well, there's this story that Jim discovered me busking outside London's Palace Theater where he was directing Jesus Christ Superstar. I was busking with a friend, a mime called Jules. No, maybe you'd better say I was busking alone. It doesn't say much for Jules. Anyway, Jim saw me and said, that's the kid I need. I don't know who made this story up. What really happened, Jim knew me and saw my work one night when he went with friends to dinner at a restaurant where I used to work as a soda jerk. I'd turned that job into a cabaret act and they asked to see my night shift. So I danced and sang to the accompaniment of the Boswell sisters. They've been a great influence in my life, but I'd better stick to the story that I was discovered busking, don't you think? So Jim knew her, sought her out, and cast her. It's honestly pretty unsurprising, given her notoriety on Australia and their shared origin. And that's everyone. Yep, that's everyone. With all the actors in place, the slog of rehearsals and refinement could begin, and everyone could figure out just what the hell they had signed up for. At least that's the same with the shadow cast. And that's our show. We want to thank Sam the Hobo for their write-in, as well as all of JCCP for very generously opening up their stage to host all of us schmucks in a couple weeks. And as always, we'd like to thank our writer Jacob and our editor Aaron from Tennessee. We appreciate all your work. If anyone has a question they'd like us to answer on air for Nikki Asks a Question, or some community news they'd like us to talk about, or even a cool story to share with the community, we'd love to include it on our show. Just go to our website, rockytalkypodcast.com, and fill out our contact form to tell us about it. If you are enjoying Rocky Talkie, please help us out by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the show. It makes the podcast more accessible to new listeners, which really helps us to grow the show. And if you want even more Rocky Talkie content, check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, all at Rocky Talkie Podcast. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. See you. It was the first Tim. uh, Tim. (laughs) It was the first Tim. Tim Curry was the first Tim. Carol Baskin's husband is alive. She did not feed him to tigers, misogynists. Her first husband. I am Team Carol Baskin, and I will die Team Carol Baskin. You You probably will die Team Carol Baskin. (laughs)